Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. I am Melissa Silva, the Executive Director for the Mental Health Association for Greater Baton Rouge, the Louisiana affiliate for the Mental Health of America. MHA has served the Baton Rouge area and our state of Louisiana for over 66 years. MHA has partnered with the Louisiana Department of Health Office of Behavior Health to offer Behavior Health 911 events. These events offer education on topics affecting all of us in our state. As an advocate to those with behavioral health needs, today we're bringing you experts in the field speaking on topics specific and critical to your region. While we cannot be face-to-face -to, -face to have these conversations, we do feel the need for them continues. There will be a time for questions and answers from our panel at the end of the conversation. Please enter your questions in the Q&A section. This is separate from the chat box. We will address as many questions as time allows. Today, we're partnering with, with Central Louisiana Human Services District to bring you behavioral health issues in correlation to rising rates of substance abuse and domestic violence. We would like to thank today's speakers for giving, giving of their time and expertise. Please enjoy today's presentation. Good morning and welcome to Behavioral Health 911. I am Cheryl Dubois with the Central Louisiana Human Services District. We have had this behavioral health event before and we welcome you to our virtual event. Um, we hope to have a, to be able to get together in person again next year. I wanted to tell you a little bit about the services that the Human Services District provides. We provide mental health services in our Caring Choices Clinic. We provide substance use treatment and we also connect people to services for developmental disabilities in central Louisiana. We are also quite involved through our prevention department with community partnerships and drug, alcohol, tobacco, and gambling prevention services. You can reach out, you can find out more about our services online at clhsd.org, or you can call us. Our administrative office is 318-487. 5191 and our Caring Choices Clinics, that's where we provide the services for the mental health and substance use treatment, is 318-484-6850. And you can always email me for more information about our services or if you'd like me to come and talk about our services anywhere in our eight parishes that we serve. And my email is Cheryl.Dubois, and you can see that on your screen uh, on my name there, at la.gov. Thank you for being here with us today. And we look forward to our Behavioral Health 911 Virtual Summit. Hello, my name is Charlene Gradney, and I'm a program manager with the Louisiana Department of Health Office of Behavioral Health. On behalf of the Office of Behavioral Health, I would like to thank and welcome each of you for joining us for today's event. We are excited to partner with MHA for community events like these. The Office of Behavioral Health has a long history of partnering with, with MHA as we share the same passion to educate individuals, families, and communities on behavioral health issues and how to access resources and programs in your local communities. The Louisiana Department of Health is committed to the advancement and promotion of positive health to include positive behavioral health practices. LDH navigates with the purpose of assisting the citizens of Louisiana every day and especially as we navigate this unprecedented health event. Dealing with disasters can cause stress and strong emotions, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. It is natural to feel anxiety, grief, and worry. Coping with these feelings and getting help when you need it will help you, your family, and your community. The Office of Behavioral Health and its partners have been very committed to the COVID-19 response efforts as the global health impact of COVID-19 affects not only physical health, but social, emotional, and behavioral health. While the physical health impacts of COVID-19 are more widely known, the emotional and mental toll of this pandemic is also far-reaching. Mental health is as important to our overall health as physical health. If these stressors are not addressed and handled properly, the impact may lead to unhealthy choices, potentially including substance use and increases in negative coping and emotionally reactive behaviors. 
As the people of Louisiana, we continue to work together to live with the new reality of COVID-19. Unfortunately, we are no strangers to crises and disasters. As Louisiana now faces recovery from the devastation caused by Hurricane Laura, it is the commitment of the Office of Behavioral Health to partner with community programs such as MHA to provide support and resources, as well as hope and encouragement. While we may be practicing physical distancing at this time, we have never been more connected to the people we are called to serve. The Office of Behavioral Health thanks MHA for hosting, for hosting this event and their commitment to serving the people of Louisiana. We would also like to thank the local partners for joining as presenters and co-hosting this event. We thank you for joining us today for this very important event. Good morning, my name is Casey McDaniel and I'm currently the Deputy Director of Behavioral Health for the Central Louisiana Human Services District. Um, mental health and substance use disorders have been a passion of mine for over 10 years now. We continue to see uh, increases in alcohol and substance use disorders nationally and locally in our communities. And we really want to provide services that combat um, those issues in our community. Uh, almost everyone that you come in contact with either knows someone who struggles with a substance use disorder um, or mental health issues or is someone who struggles. Um, in Region 6, through all eight parishes, there are multiple agencies that are doing very important work in taking care of the people of our communities. But it's a difficult job at hand, and community awareness and support is what's most important. We want our community members to be able to walk into a nearby clinic or and get services that they need, not only medically, but also behavioral health services, medication management, and everything that they are able to have um, to be able to lead productive lives that are successful to them. Um, right now, we're working on a crisis team through the LASOR 2.0 grant. And through that crisis team, we will um, utilize therapists and peer support specialists, and we will go into emergency rooms, and we will go into jails, and we will bridge gaps in between really the community and getting people into treatment services and have a holistic wraparound service on what is your intended need? What do you need from your community? What are your um, goals? And we wanna be able to bridge that gap to be able to have families that are healthy, um, people able to walk into clinics and get the services they need, see a psychiatrist, have medication management, whether they're indigent, whether they have insurance or don't have insurance. Um, quality behavioral health care is, is important and everyone should have access to it. So that is our goal is to make sure that when you walk in somewhere that you can receive services. Um, community Members need better quality and access to those uh, evidence-based interventions where you can have a successful therapeutic session and you can go in and you can really get what you need from um, your sessions and from your treatment programming. In this area, there are different types of treatment. You, there's inpatient treatment where you can go in and receive behavioral health care, medication management um, in several different places, depending on your insurance, depending on your age, uh, depending on what, what you need to take care of. Um, there's also outpatient services and uh, intensive outpatient services that not everybody's aware of. You can walk into one of our clinics and you can get group therapy, you can get individualized therapy, um, medication management, you can meet with a provider. Um, we also do uh, family therapy and you can have a holistic view and we can take care of your family also. Um, 
So I appreciate you letting me talk about some of your services today and some of the needs that are in the community. And I look forward to working with or having people call and get uh, resources and have access to better care. Hello, my name is Ricky Belgard. I'm the Addiction Resistance Program Director here at the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office in Central Louisiana. And uh, I, what a privilege it is to join this distinguished panel uh, to talk about substance abuse issues, health issues uh, that we're seeing uh, from the law enforcement perspective. We're seeing an uptick, uptick of um, uh, mental health issues coming into uh, the jail. And uh, when you have that along with the substance abuse issues, that seems to amplify everything. Uh, so we're, as law enforcement, we're not really trained to deal with mental health patients that are coming in now. And so uh, this is beginning to be a, a real strain on the law enforcement system. But uh, we're excited to have a program here in Rapids Parish that we instituted about six years ago uh, called the Addiction Resistance Program that is actually uh, uh, sat down uh, and we talked about uh, the fact that incarceration is not enough for substance abuse users or mental health people. And so what we have is a couple of options. Uh, we have the Behavioral Mental Health Court uh, that is run uh, by Judge Doggett. And uh, so that program uh, helps us with the mental health issues. And then the substance abuse issues is run by me. And uh, we found out that uh, we can take through coordinated efforts of the, the stakeholders that are involved. And the stakeholders would necessarily be the, the district attorney's office, the judge's office, uh, the criminal court system, uh, the, the sheriffs, the jails. Uh, we use the health network, uh, the mental health networks. Uh, we also use nonprofits, churches, pastors, and uh, rehabilitation facilities uh, to try to make a difference in uh, people's lives. Uh, what we would like to do is uh, uh, have a diversion program. This is basically what it is, a diversion program that will help them uh, to get them off of the substance abuses uh, issues that they're dealing with and to move them into healthy, productive citizens uh, and stop the recidivism that has continually going on uh, if we just put them in jail, uh, let them stay for a while, put them back on the street. We haven't done anything to um, uh, interdict the problem. And so uh, with this particular program that we're using, uh, I use a lot of uh, um, Christian-based rehabs, because I've found that the Christian-based rehabs, I, my percentage there is about 62.5% of a success rate. Now, when you get 62.5% success rate, uh, that's tremendous. That means that, that we're not seeing those people back in jail again. They're actually getting out. They're getting their families back. They're getting their kids back. They're getting jobs and being productive citizens, and they, they're feeling better about themselves. Uh, when people get caught up in that cycle of addiction, uh, it seems to be a black hole for them that just spirals down forever and ever, and there's no way out of it. And if we just keep treating it the same way, then we're, we're just, we're not gaining ground and uh, we're losing ground. So what we can do is if, I, if we can take those people and we can pull them out of that black hole and set them on good solid ground and give them good tools to uh, be a success, uh, we have found that they are looking for that. There's, they don't actually want to be caught up in that substance abuse and those addictions uh, of alcohol abuse or, or uh, prescription drugs or illegal drugs or whatever it might be. Uh, once they come into my office uh, and, I, and I interview them and do an assessment on them, the, the, the story is always the same. They don't want to be in that position. And so uh, when we offer them a, a chance to start afresh and anew and uh, we plug them into a rehab uh, once we have one available. And uh, when I say rehab, I don't mean a 28 day rehab or a seven day rehab or a one week rehab. I'm talking seven months to 18 months in an in-house rehab where they can actually get some help, learn to live on their own again, and actually start doing what they do and get the tools they need to be successful. And I think that's probably one of the greatest things and one of the greatest joys that I have is uh, to be able to see those same people uh, that have come in my office and uh, uh, look so haggard. And uh, when they come out of the rehab facilities, 
a lot of times I don't even recognize them because they have changed so much and the appreciation is just tremendous of, uh, for what uh, the opportunity we have been able to bless them with. And so I'm so thankful that Sheriff Wood uh, has allowed us to do this and continue to do this because the ultimate goal of our program uh, is to get those people to a point that they can get back into the general public and maintain useful, productive uh, lifestyles uh, and decrease uh, the possibility of reoffending again or, or doing more crimes uh, uh, to get their habits met. And so uh, it, it is an awesome deal to be able to do that. It's an awesome feeling to be able to help people to uh, have that hope once again. Everyone is looking for hope. Uh, a lot of times it's just not out there. And a lot of times that no one has sat down and figured out exactly what can we do to help them. And so I'm so glad that we have this. And now it's going across. Uh, uh, there are other departments that are picking up from us. And uh, we're meeting with other people and sharing our program with them and helping them to understand how to implement something like this that we can curb the substance abuse issues, uh, the alcoholic issues, and uh, uh, along with the mental health issues that are going on. Now, uh, we, 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 families are always looking for hope. And isn't it great that you have a family member that says, you know what, I'm so glad there's something that can be done besides locking my son or my daughter or my granddaughter or whomever up or my spouse up. Uh, they're actually looking for hope. And then the other side of that is the, the fact that we'll sit down with the family members and we'll help to educate the family members uh, about a pathway to recovery. Because what I find the majority of time is that families have a tendency to enable their kids, their spouses, or whomever is abused. They have a tendency to enable them. They don't. They want them to stop, but they can't stand it when they cry out for help because they have to go immediately and go back to help them immediately. And so that's one of the things that has to stop too. We have to teach families how to have tough love and how to say no. They have to be willing to love their kids enough to let them hate them for just a moment you know, so they can get the help that they need. And that's important. And so uh, we're, we're excited. Uh, like I said, we, we have the stakeholders that are involved, uh, lots going on. So, uh, God is blessing. And uh, thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this uh, presentation and just to share with you a brief overview of, of something that can help uh, of a way that maybe you haven't thought of yet. Uh, but, uh, God bless. Have a great day. Okay. Thank you for having me today. And um, I, I'm super excited about doing this and partnering with all of you. My name is Carly Long, and I am the Executive Director at the Family Justice Center here in Central Louisiana. A um, little bit of my background is I got my undergrad in Family and Child Studies at Louisiana Tech, and then I went on to get my master's in counseling from Loyola University in New Orleans and um, a pastoral studies master's degree as well. So um, it led me to the Family Justice Center, and I started counseling here um, that survived to offering counseling services to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. And I did that for a few years, and then I was able to have the opportunity to roll in to the executive director position. So I am super excited and blessed to be here. And um, hopefully I can give you some, a little bit of insight um, regarding domestic violence and substance abuse and sexual assault and what services we have to offer. So that being said, let's get started with the PowerPoint. Um, just the basic general information of what is domestic violence. Um, it is violent or aggressive behavior within the home. It typically involves um, violent abuse of a, a spouse or a partner. Um, I know several of us know or we, we have a friend or someone in the family that maybe has been through this. Um, and so it hits, it hits close to home to a lot of people. Um, some of the statistics I wanted to start off, and I put several in this PowerPoint because um, 
I wanted us to really understand the seriousness of domestic violence and that these statistics are alarming. Um, that on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner. Um, this equates to more than 10 million women um, and men, one in four women, and one in nine men, um, which is very accurate, experience severe intimate partner physical violence, um, sexual violence, this is stalking. Um, as we know, this all impacts the survivor. Um, such as injury, uh, fearfulness, post-traumatic post stress disorder, which we see a lot of, um, and obviously it leads them to the use of victim services. Um, a person is abused in the United States every nine seconds, and that is so hard to um, wrap our brains around. On average, three women are killed by a current or former intimate partner each day in the U.S. One in seven men, I'm sorry, women, and one in 18 have been stalked by an intimate partner during their lifetime at some point. Um, and this was the one statistic that I just really thought people should know. And that's on a typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines nationwide. And I'll kind of talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. Um, intimate partner violence accounts for 15% of all violent crime, which is a lot. Um, women, this is a very important statistic. Um, most domestic violence that we see here in Sin Law, um, it's, uh, the abuse happens between the ages of 18 and 24, um, which seems fairly young, but it is, it's raging, it's, it's crazy. 19% of domestic violence involves a weapon and um, domestic victimization is correlated with a higher rate of depression and suicidal behavior. And what I didn't put in there was substance abuse, but there is a high correlation between the two and we'll talk about that. Um, I did want to cover this. Did the pandemic worsen domestic violence? Um, I know maybe at some point you've asked yourself that during the pandemic, um, but the answer is yes. Um, the factors um, I wanted to share today were time to exposure, um, economic stressors, mental health and substance abuse, and more st stress and conflict at home. Um, and I had maybe a few little notes, but regarding the time to exposure, um, obviously if you're spending more hours in the day at home um, with an aggressive person, obviously the aggressive incidents are going to increase. And so that's had a um, huge factor in the worsening of domestic violence. Economic stressors, um, unemployment, financial strain, people weren't able to go to work, um, therefore their funds are cut or their, you know, income. And so it created a lot of stress on the um, aggressive incidents, aggressive people as well in the relationship. Um, mental health and substance abuse, um, these are factors that are already getting worse and then you put them together um, and it can be, um, it can really be bad. Um, I will say that substance abuse is about, I would say, 80% there's an 80% correlation. So uh, usually a domestic violence situation um, typically has substance abuse within it. And about eight, so me saying that about 80% of domestic violence incidents, um, there's always some type of substance abuse that's going on at the same time. Um, People are already experiencing stress. Um, when you look at number four, the stress and conflict at home, people are already going through stress and conflicts and uh, children in and out of school. And um, like I said, the, the stress, the burden of finances and um, you're already in an aggressive relationship. And then if uh, drugs or alcohol are involved um, and you're just limited and stuck at the house with this partner and you can't go anywhere, Obviously, domestic violence is going to increase. Um, moving on, after saying all of that, 
Um, and let me add in one more thing about substance abuse. When you look at domestic violence and substance abuse, there, there are a lot of similarities, and that is obviously a loss of control, um, continued behavior, that it's just a never-ending cycle, it seems. Um, and that both of those conditions, when you put those together, they can uh, tend to worsen over time, which leads to addiction, and then you're in a whole nother set of issues and um, different ball game. And so when, when thinking of domestic violence and when uh, trying to help these survivors break the cycle, um, the Family Justice Center, that's where we step in. And that's where we want to say, okay, how can we, how can we help decrease domestic violence? How can we stop family violence? And how can we help um, people with substance abuse? Um, how can we help them conquer this addiction? Um, so the Family Justice Center, what we have to offer here in Sin Law is a, um, it's a hidden gem, honestly, um, that the mission of our center is to stop family violence, to make the Able to provide. We are a one-stop shop, so we offer all of the services under one roof. Um, they're allowed, or allowed, they're provided um, a chance to speak with an advocate, develop a safety plan, um, interview with a detective from the Rapids Parish Sheriff's Office, meet with the prosecutor. We have a civil legal attorney on staff, um, and being that we're nonprofit, we're able to provide free legal services. We can help a client get a divorce if they're getting out of a um, abusive relationship or marriage. We can help with custody matters. Um, anything regarding that we are able to provide in the civil legal department. Um, we're also able to provide um, mental health services, which is a, um, a huge deal. We have so many good agencies in our area that provide mental health counseling and um, fortunately we, we are one of those and we have two counselors on staff who provide the mental health long-term counseling um, and and hopefully here in the next month we are going to have a substance abuse counselor on site who will uh, be substance abuse certified um, and we're going to offer substance abuse groups um, starting off just once a month and so stay tuned so that you can um, find out more information regarding that but we, we do hope to have a substance abuse certified counselor um, that will be able to offer um, specific counseling to those who need it. Um, next is I just put on here partnering agencies because I know many people don't really understand what we do and who we reach out to. Uh, we work with the Faith House, who's another domestic violence center. Um, obviously, the Sheriff's Department, we work with the police departments. Um, we serve in nine different parishes. Right now, there's three main that we're super involved with, and that's um, Avoles and Grant, um, or two as of right now. So we are expanding and we're growing, and we're really happy about that. The DA's office is very involved as well because we work with them when it comes to the civil legal side of um, with prosecution and different things like that, um, protective orders and. Um, custody filings. So they've been really helpful in this process. Um, the benefits of the Family Justice Center, um, I stated this briefly a second ago. So before there was a Family Justice Center, people, clients, they just had to travel all over town for multiple appointments. So if you had to go to the courthouse to file a protect order, or um, you had to go to the sheriff's office to file a, um, to make a report, uh, whatever, it was you had to travel to different agencies. Now with one facility, you can come in and you can get all of those services under one roof. And so it helps eliminate a lot of stress and a lot of the anxiety that the survivor is feeling because they can just stay put in one place and all of those services be provided. Um, the Family Justice Center is, uh, the way it's defined is, and you can read it along with the multi, 
agency multidisciplinary service center where public and private agencies assign staff members on a full-time or part-time basis in order to provide services to victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, um, elder abuse, human trafficking, um, and obviously we want to reduce the number um, and reduce the number of places that these victims go. And so that's why we have a one-stop shop. The Family Justice Center model, this is just, I wanted to throw this in there just so you could see that we offer advocacy and transportation. We offer civil legal, we offer mental health counseling, safety planning, um, we offer children's services, which we really focus on the sexual abuse and domestic violence. Um, if this is out of our realm, we always refer out, um, work well with the uh, Children's Advocacy Network, and so we are always referring to them if it's a case out of our scope. Um, on the advocacy side, we can help provide housing, um, get them set up for a medical examination, we can help with jobs, um, obviously mentoring if they need help with um, food assistance or hygiene assistance, um, anything like that we, we can definitely help and provide. So the new thing I wanted to share is one of our new services um, is our on-call program. And this is a crisis line after hours and it's offered to our law enforcement only. And it's to provide secure emergency shelter um, for victims to um, have shelter. So if they are, if a line officer approaches a scene and um, it's a domestic, then he can decide, okay, this person needs to leave and get out of here. Um, he, he now has a place, he now has an agency to call, which is us, and then he has a place to offer that victim. Um, and what we do is we work with the sheriff's office and we work with the police departments and they can call our on-call number after hours and we do a little assessment over the phone um, to make sure it qualifies for our services. And then we are able to get them into a hotel um, if it's on the weekend, we can provide up to three nights on the weekend and then during the week up to one night and then we can get them in our center the following morning, get them, um, you know, help for their substance abuse or help for the domestic violence. So this has been a great blessing to our law enforcement officers. This is just showing in our area in Sin Law. Um, in 2019, there were 300 restraining orders issued in Rapids Parish. Um, that was over two quarters. So within six months, you have 300 restraining orders being filed. Louisiana, oh, I'm sorry. Louisiana is the second leading state in domestic violence. Um, and you know, it's, I've put this on here, but it's virtually impossible to know exactly how many cases are actually reported. So these are just the ones that are reported that we know of. Um, and on average, we serve anywhere. It's usually, I put average because it's 120, average is about 125 new clients every quarter. Um, sometimes that can decrease to around 110, and then sometimes we have as many as 140 ish 145 so and both are male and female um, I know last quarter we served it nine males so um, it, it happens to both and you know realizing that domestic violence it it can happen to anyone um, any age no matter your status quo you know it, it's it can happen to any of us so um, the growing movement so family just center model it's been identified as one of the best practices um, in the field of domestic violence intervention and prevention. And so we hope that we can continue to reduce the fear and anxiety um, for victims and their children. And um, we hope that everyone will take um, advantage of our collaborative services that we offer. And we hope that you reach out to us. Our next or the next slide I put on here was just our contact information um, for everyone. And we now have a website, www.fjcsinlaw.org. And again, if I just encourage you to, to stay tuned because we, like I said, we're going to eventually offer the substance abuse um, 
groups, and that will be once a month, you know, that will be provided by a certified substance abuse counselor. And we also just started trauma groups, you know, so if you know people or anyone that's been through a uh, unhealthy relationship with abuse involved, uh, please reach out to us and look on our website for more information. Um, I appreciate you listening today and uh, for giving me this opportunity, and I hope it was somewhat informative um, just for all to see that it does occur. Domestic violence is a, it's a massive issue, um, and we just want to help tackle that and break the cycle. So thank you again for your time. Hey everyone, um, Melanie, can you give me a thumbs up that you can hear me okay? You're good. Okay, thanks. All right, hey everybody, my name is Erin York. I am a licensed addiction counselor and a licensed professional counselor in Shreveport, Louisiana. I'm the program director for an outpatient facility called Forever Wellness and Recovery. Um, and I'm also the program director for a new inpatient facility called the Uprising Addiction Center, also in Shreveport. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so we can see my PowerPoint because I am live right now. Okay, everybody can see that okay, Melanie? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so one thing I do um, in my practice and in inpatient is we really focus on substance use disorders. And um, I'm a really big advocate for medication assisted treatment, um, primarily for the Vivitrol injection. And some of you guys may know what this is, some may not. Um, I felt this was a good topic because I speak with a lot of counselors and, and they say like, oh, this isn't my role. You know, this is a doctor because it's medicine. And actually there is a role that we play as therapists and advocates and um, any type of face-to-face um, -face contact you might have with someone with a substance use disorder, primarily opiate and alcohol use disorder, because that's what Vivitrol treats. Unfortunately, it does not treat other substances like methamphetamines or marijuana use disorder, um, but hopefully that'll be something in the future that can be developed. Um, so I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about how we can communicate better with our clients and people that come across um, us for services and how we can help them. So common myths about Vivitrol, I continue to hear mainly from other therapists. Oh, that's like Suboxone, right? Um, absolutely not. Um, when you hear medication assisted treatment, people usually jump to methadone, Subutex and Suboxone. Um, those are medicines used in treatment, um, but this is completely different. Um, Suboxone, Subutex and methadone, those are agonists. Uh, which means they have an active opiate in the medication. Um, Vivitrol is an antagonist, which means there's no opiates, it's non-addictive, it's not controlled. Isn't that just another crutch? Um, so a lot of times I hear this saying um, that people need to not use any kind of medicine, that therapy is the only way to get clean and sober. Um, that's not always the case either. Um, we use medicine for all other disorders in mental health. We use antidepressants, antipsychotics, anti-anxiety medications, um, and that is medication assisting treatment, which is counseling. So I don't like to consider it a crutch. I like to consider it a tool. Why wouldn't you, why would you swap one addiction for another? Um, this is, this goes back to Vivitrol is not a controlled substance, it's not a narcotic, it's not addictive, it's not even habit forming. Can you overdose on that? Absolutely not. Um, when you read about Vivitrol, you're gonna hear that overdose can happen, and I'm gonna explain that later. Um, it's really hard to do, but they have to put it in, in all their paperwork because it is a blocker. So it can kind of trick an addict's brain um, to think that they're using and they're trying to get that high and then they can actually overdose. It's very rare, but it's possible. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So the definition of MAT, um, so SAMHSA is my, is my go-to when I'm looking up um, addiction information. Um, MAT is the use of medications in combination with counseling and behavior therapies to provide the whole patient approach to the treatment of substance use disorders. 
Medication used in MAT are approved by the Food and Drug Administration and MAT programs are clinically driven and tailored to meet each patient needs. So MAT is not for everyone, um, but it's definitely for um, some people who, you know, chronically relapse or need something else. And I'm going to show how that works in the brain. Research also shows that a combination of meds and therapy can successfully treat those disorders. And for some people struggling with addiction, MAT can help sustain recovery. MAT is also used to prevent or reduce opiate overdose. Hmm. With that being defined, wouldn't all antidepressants be considered medication of treatment too? I got my little Freud guy thinking. Um, this is just another thing to ponder about and think about. Um, like I said earlier, we use medicine and other treatments for other disorders. So my goals for today is to teach the education behind MAT focusing on Divitrol. Because like I said, there's many other medications. We've heard of antabuse, Camprol for alcohol use disorder. But today I'm focusing on Divitrol. I'm going to show you how to teach your clients about Divitrol. And I'm going to teach you how a rep can come to you. So um, this is a really good statistic. Uh, I learned this um, at a Vivitrol workshop. The percentage of relapse after one leaves an institution such as treatment or jail. And when I say institution, I just mean when, when a client goes and stays there for a period of time, whether it be rehab or if they have to go to prison or jail. The number, 93%. This statistic also says that that relapse happens within the first 12 days of them coming home. Way too high. So what is Vivitrol? Uh, it's an opiate blocker and it can help lower alcohol consumption administered by healthcare provider. So it's administered by an outpatient clinic, inpatient, a pharmacy, or a doctor. It's once a month. Uh, it's used with counseling. It's non-addictive, not a narcotic, and does require an opiate detox. Vivitrol is a prescription injectable medicine used to treat alcohol dependence. You should stop drinking before starting Vivitrol. Prevents relapse to opiate dependence after opiate detox. So for opiates, you have to be clean for roughly seven to 10 days. It kind of depends on your provider. Um, alcohol, it's best if you're detox, but technically you can take the Vivitrol injection um, with alcohol in your system. It's not gonna put you into withdrawals. Okay, so this is um, this was actually from the Vivitrol website, and this actually comes in a really cool book, and I've got some of my materials here I wanted to show y'all. Um, it's a really neat book that my representative brought me, and um, on one side, when you're when you're presenting it, the client can see this, but on the other side, it's for the counselor, and it's the same thing, but it tells you what to say. It's really neat, um, and that was free for me. My rep just brings it um, all the time. So this kind of explains why patient assisted treatment is so important. Um, if we were to cut the brain in half, we're gonna see two parts. So that teeny tiny limbic region is that blue part. That is for that impulsive pleasure, basic driving urges. So no matter what, no matter how clean somebody is, if you put their drug of choice in front of them, that limbic is gonna light up. Now that doesn't mean they're gonna relapse, but it means that it's gonna light up. The white part, the bigger part is that cortex. This is where the counseling, thinking, reasoning, decision-making groups, AA, sponsorship, faith-based, whatever comes into play. My favorite analogy to explain this is everybody has seen a depressed person, right? And they say, oh, just get up, go exercise, go be with friends, go outside. A real depressed person can't even get up out of the bed right? So we do what? We usually prescribe a medicine, like an antidepressant that gets them up to go out and do those things. So how Vivitrol kind of works is it gets the impulses and the cravings down enough to where you can go to counseling and go work on those things and learn coping skills. Um, it's not just a cure-all. It helps quiet down the cravings and get you to really develop that cortex. You know, people say, oh, if they just had better coping skills or if they just knew their relapse prevention skills. Um, but some clients can't even get there because their relapses keep happening. So um, this is kind of cheesy looking, but this is how I explain it to clients because clients are not, um, sometimes they have no idea what I'm talking about when I throw scientific words and lingo and brain out. So what I do, I, I get on my whiteboard board and I draw a big circle and I say, this is your brain. And I draw little buckets just like this. 
and I say, you have buckets in your brain and we call them receptors and they're mu receptors. These receptors are only for alcohol and opiates. Okay. These buckets want to be filled with alcohol or opiates. And I draw this, then I draw more buckets and I say, you have an addictive brain. So you have developed more buckets. That's why you crave your alcohol or your opiates. You're craving more uh, than the non-addictive brain. So what Vivitrol does is it comes in and it puts lids on all those buckets, all those mu receptors. And that way it kind of quiets your cravings down. It's your brain thinks your buckets are full. And so your cravings are turned down by over 50% and relapses tend to not happen when we don't have cravings, right? After I draw the buckets, I then say about the lids. At this time they say, but what about the other things I enjoy? They'll say, is that gonna make me a zombie or am I gonna enjoy things? Vivitrol only acts on the mu receptors. The mu receptors are for alcohol and opiates. Everything else is not affected. Family shopping, eating, spending time with your kids, your favorite candy bar, all those you're still gonna enjoy. If the client uses alcohol or opiates, they would come in and see that they cannot get inside the buckets to work properly. Opiates are completely blocked, whereas alcohol isn't blocked, but there's no dopamine release. Therefore, a client wouldn't typically want to continue to drink and usually will not drink to excess. So basically how I explain it is alcohol and opiates is like a ball and it wants to come in and jump into those buckets. When it's in the bucket, dopamine releases and that's what makes us happy and continue to use. The ball can't even get in the bucket. So the release doesn't happen. I use a lot of analogies to explain with clients because it is kind of a hard concept to you know, understand sometimes. So the process of starting the injection, I go over the process with all my clients. Um, number one, you're gonna first do an assessment. That assessment can be whatever you want. I use an ASAM assessment. Some people use an ASI. Some people have their own assessment. Um, you're gonna sign consents. Um, a consent is basically they understand how Vivitrol works. I've made my own. Um, you can find them online. Educate on the process. And you also are gonna wanna do a drug screen. Um, you're gonna do a drug screen to make sure they're not positive for any opiates. Even if they say, no, I've never taken an opiate. Some people, believe it or not, don't even know what all opiates are. And so it's just good to CYA and, and do a drug screen. You're then gonna consult with your doctor on staff to ensure the client is a candidate for the injection. So give your doctor a call. Hey, this person's got this going on. I think they're a candidate. Um, your doctor will then call in an oral form of Vivitrol, which some of you may know is naltrexone. It's the same medicine, it's just an oral version. Um, it's about 50 milligrams. This is to double check to make sure your client doesn't have a reaction. Because remember the shot is once a month, um, the oral is once a day. So if I give one a shot of Vivitrol and they have some kind of crazy allergic reaction, they're gonna have that every day for 30 days. The oral, they're only gonna have the reaction for a day and we'll say, you know, they're not a candidate because they have some kind of funky reaction. I will pick up the oral and they'll take it for two to five days. This may depend on your doctor's order. I've seen doctors say one to two days. I've seen a doctor say seven, kind of just depends on how they feel um, about the medicine. Um, the cool thing about having the oral on hand is um, after they take it for two to three days, they've got, you know, 20 something pills left. So at the end of the month, if they feel you know, that their shot might be wearing off or they might feel extra craving. They can take an oral naltrexone before their next injection and it won't hurt them. Once the client confirms no negative side effects, you'll complete the form. I use Fast Pharmacy to order um, my Vivitrol. It's one form. It's basically a demographic form, name, date of birth, insurance information. Fax it in. Shot will arrive in about three or four days. Um, when the shot comes in, I always do one more drug screen an instant cup before I give the injection or my nurse. I don't personally give it, but our nurse does um, just to make sure that they don't have any opiates in their system and they're good to go. A um, couple more things I wanted to, sh to share before I did this last slide. Um, I also go over, um, my rep has made these for me. It's basically a um, emergency pain management bracelet this is so clients on Vivitrol can have this on them at all times. Um, in the rare, you know, instance that someone gets in a car accident, you know, they might need pain medication. If the paramedic doesn't know that someone is on Vivitrol, they're going to stick them with 
probably an opiate pain relief and it's going to be blocked. So it's always good that you educate your clients that they have got to have something like this on them if they're on the medicine. Also encourage them to share with family, doctors, put it in their phone under their medical um, information that they're on Vivitrol um, just in case. It's rare, but it's just, you know, a good policy to have. Um, there's Vivitrol representatives all throughout the state of Louisiana. Um, you can go to vivitrolhcp.com and then you would select request a rep. Um, I know we have one in Shreveport, and I know there is also one in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, I just know that because I've personally worked with them. I'm assuming there are more. Um, but even if there's not, I know my Shreveport uh, rep will, she has so many districts that she can go to and, and drive to. Um, so definitely get a rep to come to you. This is how I've been educated on Vivitrol, and I didn't think... Um, I didn't know how easy it was to really do it. Um, I've got about seven people on Vivitrol right now and I've seen major success. Their cravings are down. Um, they're coming to, you know, group here with me. They're doing counseling, they're doing meetings. Um, but um, I couldn't believe how easy it was to become a site um, because with Vivitrol, you have to have, you know, a doctor, you have to do um, the drug screen and then offer the counseling. So it's really cool that Forever Wellness and Recovery, we do all of it under one roof. Um, and so I know a lot of counseling agencies don't do it, but it's very, very simple. Um, it's a lot easier than you think. And um, if anybody wants um, any help with it, I can um, be of help. I've been doing the patrol for about a year in my facility. I've had no issues. It's worked out really, really well. Um, success rate is super high. It's over 80% success rate when you pair Vivitrol with counseling. Um, so again, my name is Erin York. And if you have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer. Um, but I'm all done. Melanie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending our uh, Behavioral Health 911 with these excellent panelists. They shared some really great information and resources with us. So now we are going to open up um, a few questions and answers. So, um, Aaron, I'm gonna, um, they have two questions in the chat that just came through. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you. Um, so does Vivitrol only work on alcohol and opiates? Or what about um, any other type of addiction since it's, you know, in the brain? It only works on the mu receptors. And those receptors are responsible for alcohol and opiates. So as of right now, Vivitrol only works um, for those two substances. I have seen some research that now Trexone, the oral form, can also help with gambling disorder, um, which is not a drug at all. Um, but it also takes down the, that impulsive and that craving to gamble. Um, I personally haven't had anyone on the naltrexone for gambling use disorder. I mean, gambling disorder. Um, but I've, I've worked in a facility where I've seen some people on it and they, they swear by it. But me personally, I have not given it for that. And does it work for depression? I haven't seen any research on it, um, only because I, I think it, it goes back to that receptor. We have a thousand receptors in our brain. They're all responsible for different things. And so I haven't heard of it helping depression. And how long does the client have to stay on Vivitrol? Um, that's a magical question. Um, my rep has a really good theory behind it, and I, I kind of go with her answer. The, the client can stay on it as little or as long. There is no withdrawal. If they say, hey, I'm just not going to get my shot next month, they just don't get it. There's no withdrawal. There's no negative side effects. They just don't get their second shot. Um, but my rep will explain to you, she says, I love if people stay on Vivitrol for a year. And I know that sounds long, but she has a, she has a good theory. You get to go through everything once on Vivitrol. You go through Christmas, New Year's, Thanksgiving, 4th of July, anniversaries, birthdays, Mardi Gras. You know, Mardi Gras in Louisiana is big. Um, Memorial Day, all the holidays. You go through everything with Vivitrol um, being on your side and you get to experience all those things with help with this tool. So that's a really good, um, that's a really good time frame, but it can be less or more. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Belgard, I think these, this is for you. Um, 
what particular services or interventions and level of care are you talking about when you say Christian-based services? When we talk about faith-based services, uh, these are uh, services that do cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, they have uh, trained counselors on site. Uh, that's the ones that we like to use. Uh, they will also, um, uh, you know, range in time from anywhere from seven months to 18 months of, of in-house rehab. So they literally get the uh, in-house rehab. They're literally in that facility. Uh, it's like sober living, but more intense. I guess is the way to, to explain that. Okay, and do you know if um, psychotropic drugs like SSRIs or mood stabilizers are allowed in the longer term faith-based so programs? What happens is, right, so what, what we're seeing is, and I, and I appreciate Erin's um, the, the talk and, and her uh, laying that out about the Vivitrol because one of the concerns that we have is methadone. You know, when we put people on methadone, that's pretty well the rest of their life. You're trading one drug for another. And then they came out with the Suboxone. And Suboxone, we can actually kind of wean them off, but it's very hard. So what we're seeing is, is a tremendous amount of people that are hooked on the opioids, uh, the heroin, the fentanyl, and, and the carfentanyl that's coming in, and those that make it through that you know, in other words, we don't find them on the street dead. Uh, when we pick them up, we find out that they have to have medically assisted treatment and they've got to be detoxed from that. Because if you just pick those people up and put them into a rehab, you're setting them up for failure. And uh, when we when we take them out of jail, uh, we do not want to set them up for failure. We want, to, we want to try to set them up for success. Now, whether they go through with that success or not is depending upon their own decisions, what they make from their own. But yes, yeah, some of the, uh, uh, the, the faith-based services uh, will allow certain types of the drugs in, and, and if they're on uh, some psychotropic stuff, then we have to put them into a different place, yeah. But uh, so each case is different. There's no cookie cutter uh, formula that says, okay, you meet this, 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 and this, we're gonna plug you here. No, uh, when we sit down and do the, do the assessments on them and work with the people, uh, we find out which place is actually gonna work better. Like I said, a lot of times we'll have to put them into a, a long leaf or a 28 day uh, facility, Edgefield we use a lot, uh, that they can do some uh, medical detox. Uh, if we have not done that in the jail. Now, I will tell you that in Rapids Parish, I don't, I can't speak for every jail, but for Rapids Parish, we do have doctors and nurses that are in the jail uh, at, at all time right now. And that is, so when I, when we have people that come in and I know they've got to be detoxed and they're going to be coming off of these drugs, uh, then we watch them very carefully and, and assist with that. Thank you. Ms. Long, do you think that alcohol and substance use affects abusers or victims at a higher rate? So I would say um, typically if a victim has been involved in an abusive relationship at some point in their past, statistics show that they're more likely to abuse alcohol or, I mean, have substance abuse issues. Um, it, it's kind of equal um, as to what we see on an everyday basis. Um, it's, oh gosh, it's, um, say the victims are just as much involved in substance abuse as the aggressor. Um, and typically if substance abuse is involved, they are not able to make um, decisions. They can't think correctly. They don't understand that the abuse is even as bad as it is. You know, they cannot, they just cannot see it. And so I would say it's pretty equivalent, but definitely victims um, have a higher chance of using if they've been, you know, involved in an abusive relationship. And can I get more information on the, the mental health services that you also offer? Yes. So we have um, two social workers on site. Um, one is finishing her master's right now. So she'll be a um, registered social worker or licensed social worker, I should say. So we have two social workers on site um, provide the mental health counseling. And um, basically it's 
majority is trauma focused. Um, we do a lot of CBT therapy and um, we, um, they stay busy. They serve a Bulls Parish in our parish. So they have full clientele. Right now there's a waiting list, but um, it moves pretty quickly. Um, and hopefully, like I said, once we get that substance abuse counselor, even though it'll just be, you know, once a month that we'll be able to have him or her, um, I think that's going to help out tremendously too, because there is so much substance abuse involved in domestics. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. McDonald, can you give examples of the evidence-based interventions you spoke about? Um, yes, we use uh, different methods of evidence-based treatment options. Um, MET, which is motivational enhancement therapy. Uh, we utilize CBT, um, DBT skills. Um, we, just as um, was said before, we take into account what exactly the client needs, and then we curtail their treatment plan to that. It depends on the trauma um, that they've had, or is it substance use disorders, or what type of substance use disorders. So we have a very um, educated and experienced staff in both mental health and substance use disorders. And so we're able to take a look, assess, and then go from using things that have been already proven successful for patients. And what are some warning signs that a loved one might be displaying if they are having substance use issues? Some of the warning signs, um, can, it can be difficult. There's different signs that you can look at. Most of the time, when you, you know your loved one's behavior. And so when that behavior starts to deviate, um, it could be, it could mimic depression. It could be your loved one is missing for extended periods of time. There's money that is missing, or you can find maybe open bottles or different things around your home. Um, so it's really looking at your specific loved one, what their behavior was before and what you're seeing now. And so it's really good to be able to open up those lines of communication and talk um, to whether it's your spouse or your parents um, and kind of see what's going on with them in their everyday life. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Long, one more question just came through for you. Um, it says, for the wraparound services for the Family, Just the Family Justice Center offers, do you um, have the services available or are they contracted out to other services? Um, so all the services are provided here at the Justice Center. Um, they're all active as we speak. Um, the only services that right now we're contracting out are for the substance abuse counselor and um, a few other programs that we're fixing to start, but um, those are the only ones that are that are contracted out. And then, like I said at the presentation, we, you know, work we with our partner agencies. And um, if there's any case that is out of our scope, like I said, um, or we feel like we're not qualified to handle it to the best of our ability, we will refer um, out. But yes, all the, the services are provided here at the Family Justice Center. Okay, thank you. Ms. York, I have another question for you. Um, so does insurance pay for Vivitrol and what about Medicaid? Um, and I'm also so will it allow for the injection? Yes, I'm so glad someone asked this because I left it out. Medicaid covers Vivitrol at 100%. 100%. Um, most commercial insurance also pay for it at 100%. So I talked about that fast pharmacy form that you'll fill out when you're wanting um, a person to be on it. You send that in and um, they'll come back to either you or the client and say, hey, you're covered or hey, you have a $50 copay. I have one person that has a $70 copay and he has um, tr a TRICARE federal plan. The shot self-pay is over $1,200. So 
So I do get some people that have no insurance that want it. And I say, well, you know, the shot's really expensive, but the oral form, the naltrexone is only about 40 bucks. And so sometimes that's a really good option. You know, if, if you know an opiate addict, you know, they're spending two, $300 probably a week. Um, and so $40 a month to keep them clean and sober is just a, a small dent in their pocket and it's worth it. Um, but Medicaid, all the Medicaid plans, all five, 100% cover the injection, which is amazing. All right, great. Someone requested your um, contact information. So can you either type it in the chat or just say it right now? In the chat or the Q&A? The chat. Okay, so I'm going to, um, hold on, where is it? Okay, so uh, I'm putting my name and then I'm gonna put um, where I work, my outpatient, I'm gonna put forever wellness and recovery and then I'm gonna put um, my phone number and an email address for everyone. Okay, thank you. Mr. Belgard, can you talk about the steps of the diversion and what happens after the interview process? Okay, uh, so as far as uh, the interview happens, uh, we make a determine with the person that we're interviewing. Now, it really depends um, because there's, we actually can take these in in three different ways. One is the volunteer um, that would come in to us and just you know say, I need help. The other one is parents that, and we're getting a lot of that nowadays, by the way, parents that will actually bring the, bring someone in, their children, their teenagers, or, uh, or either uh, their older kids. And they're not, they, they have not been arrested yet for substance abuse issues, but their parents know they're doing them. And uh, they'll come in and we'll talk with them and make decisions with them also. But if it's someone that we have incarcerated, uh, then we will do the interview with them. We will we'll look at their charges because uh, not everyone would qualify for our program. In other words, uh, there's, a, there's like six things that we look at. The offense um, was a direct or indirect result of substance abuse. That's number one to even get to my office. The offense was nonviolent. Uh, we'll not do anything with violent issues. Uh, the judicial system believes that the individual would benefit from the rehab. The individual qualifies for a probationary sentence drugs and weapons were not involved, and the individual was not a convicted uh, felon in possession of a weapon. Once they pass those things uh, and, and they get through, then uh, we do the interview. After the interview, then we would uh, discuss with them uh, what, is, what, are their, what, are they, what do they want their future to look like? And then we will sit down with them and discuss the different types of rehabs that are available. And then once that decision is made, uh, we will work and, and uh, make sure that everything is in place to uh, help them get to that rehab. And so there's a lot of judicial system uh, that, has to, that, that has to be done um, to be able to move them where, where they need to go. So, but, but yes, we make all that happen. All right, great. And Ms. Long, uh, who would someone contact if they would like to share partner agency information? Um, we serve first-time pregnant moms throughout the, the Nurse Family Partnership Program, and we have referred our clients to the, the Family Justice Center in the past, and they would really like to collaborate and talk more. Absolutely. Um, myself, you can call me, email me, um, and I, I can do what Erin did and type it in the chat if that's easiest, um, or you can contact um, Michelle Graham. Um, she works here at the Family Justice Center and you can ask to speak with her and she'll make sure I get all of the calls and information. And um, but definitely I would love to speak with whoever that is. All right, great. So we don't have any more questions in the, the Q&A box or the chat box. So. Um, audience, please, if you have any more, feel free to send it now. Um, but I want to thank you again for attending. My name is Melanie Henderson, and I'm the Advocacy and Education Manager with the Mental Health Association for Greater Baton Rouge. And um, at the end of this, my information will be on the screen. So if you have any questions you would like to, um, you know, get in touch with the panelists, I absolutely can 
put you in touch with them. I wanna thank our partners, the Central Louisiana Human Services District, and then all of our wonderful panelists. Y'all y'all were great. And we hope you enjoyed and are really leaving here with some um, you know, important information. I had one more thing I wanted to add. Go ahead. Um, so if you guys um, have anybody who lives in like a rural area or um, is wanting the shot, um, I have people that will drive here just for the injection and they get their counseling at other places. So on the Vivitrol website, you can go to uh, find a provider or find an injection site, something like that. Um, I have some people that say, hey, I live in Ruston. I get counseling in Ruston, but I need a place to get my second injection. I have people that come here just for the injection and then they, they go about their way. Um, so you can also search um, to find another injection site. And you might have one closer to you um, than you think. Some counseling centers do it and some pharmacies give it, um, but that's also on the website. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone again for attending. I hope you have a wonderful day. We have a few more, few more of these behavioral health 911 scheduled. So please check our website and our social media to find out more. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy right. being with everyone. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.